you're up and you got about a minute 40. I'll make it fast. Hey, we thank everybody who's tuning in right now, especially the partners who are streaming this show in addition to being on our website. You can be catching us at wardsauto.com, rumblestrip.net, and dcautogeek.com. Remember, we want all your questions for the rapid fire part of the show. Send us an email to viewermail at autolinedetroit.tv or go to bit.ly slash after hours. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash after hours. Or give us a call. We love getting the phone calls. 1-620-288-6546. And I'll say that again. 1-620-288-6546. I want to thank our volunteers helping us monitor the chat room, Mud Monster, DC Auto Geek, and Scott in Cleveland. Remember, we'll post the video of this show shortly after this show. You can get the podcast at the iTunes store. It'll be free, available tomorrow afternoon. And just look for AutoLine After Hours. Don't forget, you can also listen to our shows on your, Stitch or on your BlackBerry or smartphone, thanks to Stitcher. And uh, you can... If you sign up right now, you can be in the run-in to win $100. Just go to stitcher.com slash autoline, and the promo code is autoline. And we're going to get going immediately. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by... Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. Well, thanks for joining us, folks. And Peter, thanks for coming back to the studio here with me. Always good to be here. Yeah, that was pretty awesome last week at the Dream Cruise. Yeah, it was awesome. We could have done another three hours, I'm sure. Oh, easy. And uh, Jim and Bob Hall could have filled in two hours and 57 seconds of it, or 57 minutes of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't actually go to the, the cruise itself that day because I understand a big storm went through and yeah. then shut it down early. I was at the... American Le Mans series in uh, Elkhart Lake. How was that? It was absolutely a spectacular. I know you were writing race. about it in your site. Uh, just a week. spectacular. What road racing should be it was just fantastic. And lots of good rumors coming out of there. Spent some time with Scott Atherton. And, um, and you know, everyone says IndyCar belongs there in that weekend. And I'm, I'm hopeful in 2012 that's going to happen. It'll be a doubleheader up there. Well, that'd be great, and as you well remember, you know, that's when they had uh, the Detroit Grand Prix here on Belle Isle. They did ALMS and IndyCar, yeah. Saturday and Sunday kind of venue. It went over great. Yeah, plus all the drivers want to be there. The teams want to be there. It's kind of the heritage of IndyCar. You know, Formula 5000 ran there before mm. IndyCar did. I remember going to Formula 5000, seeing Mario Andretti and Brian Redman and David Hobbs battling in those... Uh, didn't AJ run there too, or no? Yeah, AJ had his uh, pretty much almost finished his career. He, uh, I think, he lost his brakes at the end of the the pit straight and mm -hmm. crashed pretty heavy. Yeah, broke his legs. It was it was bad. Um, but you know, Road America is, is the the premier road racing circuit in the U.S. So I expect IndyCar to be there. Mm -hmm. I also think that. Um, we will see a third road race in the Sprint Cup, and we will see Michigan or Pocono lose one of their second dates, and we will see that third road race at Road America, and it'll be in the chase. Don't be surprised if that happens. It's going to be... Um, well, that's something you've been talking about, yeah, how they need to get a road course. But the rumblings are, are getting louder, and they're coming from within NASCAR, so... Hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if along about 2014 we see that change in the NASCAR schedule, which would be fantastic. Yeah, it would. And uh, other racing news, Danica is officially leaving IndyCar. Going to NASCAR, though in the Nationwide Series, Nationwide, right? but with a partial uh, grouping of Sprint Cup races. Why do you think that is? Why mainly Nationwide be for now? Well, because Tony Stewart basically confirmed that she's going to be in Sprint Cup in 2013. Uh-huh. So... I think she's going to have her hands full, but 
Oh, it's such a competitive series. I, that's why I wondered if she's going into Nationwide, because she'll go in with a strong team, better chance of performing well there. Well, she's been doing those races, so she has to run a full season up there to really, really get the flow of it. Mm -hmm. Best of luck to her. Yeah. It's, uh, it's brutal when you see other very top-notch drivers, Jacques Villeneuve, uh, Dario. Dario from First, he TV. had a bad luck when he, he got a broken leg. And, uh, yeah, I know, but, uh, you know, even you look at somebody like Montoya, who's really good, no, he's, uh, and he, he's, he struggles in that series. Well, he, he's very good, and he's right there in just about every race, but that just tells you, because I think he's one of the most talented drivers in the world, mm -hmm. period, so... It shows you how competitive a series it is. Yeah, yeah. So what happened in the car industry this week besides? I, I thought there was a lot of interesting things that yeah. were uh, going on. First, this announcement with Ford and Toyota teaming up to do hybrid trucks together, and that came out of the blue. Out I mean, of the that blue, That did yeah. not leak at all. No, in fact, I think it caught people within Ford and within Toyota by surprise. I think it was only known at the very, very top. Yeah, I think you're right. And I've had a lot of people say, is Ford crazy? Why would they share all their truck stuff with Toyota? And my read of it is, well, they're not. You know, everybody knows when you look at the end of this decade and how CAFE standards really start to get tough, including for trucks and SUVs. You know, when Mark Royce was on this show a while back, even he said he didn't see how you could avoid electrification yeah, in you, trucks and pickups. Yeah, they're all going to be hybrids. They're, they're going to have to have at least some hybrid models yeah. to, to balance it all out. And who knows if it'll sell. I mean, GM's got hybrid trucks and SUVs right now, and they can't give them away. There's no interest in these things whatsoever. So if I'm Ford, I'm thinking, what the hell do I do? I got to develop the system. It's going to be really expensive. Hey, let's call Toyota. Let's see if we can split the cost here. Yeah, I don't think they're going to give away any secrets. It's just a focused on one part of the trucks. So. Right. I, I don't see them sharing platforms, bodies, nothing like that. I just see... In fact, I could see, you know, Ford saying, hey, Toyota, we'll take uh, the motor and the transmission. You take the power electronics and the battery and, you know, just literally split the project down the middle and not only share the cost, but cut the development time in half as well. Yeah, yeah. But I thought it was interesting that it was Ford and Toyota. Yeah. You know, GM uh, had been doing a whole lot with Toyota in the past and... Toyota is a company that, by and large, likes to go it alone, and you know they've sort of put themselves up on the pedestal as the the masters of hybridization. So the fact that they would want to split this cost with Ford tells you I think everybody's worried about it. They're yeah. worried about the fuel economy standards. Yeah, plus Toyota's been knocked down a couple notches. Then, of course, they introduced the the new Camry on the same day that Porsche releases photos of the 2012 911. I thought that was <laughs> just like, bad luck that. <laughs> but uh, the Camry, you know, you read the specs, I'm sure it's better. You said the interior's ni it's nicer, but God. It, it is, but it isn't either. It I doesn't mean, look like anything. I mean, the, the landscape has changed. You've got the Focus, you've got the Cruise, you've got the Elantra. Cars with real visual personalities, mm -hmm. and this Camry is just like, you know, it's it's a rolling piece of white bread going down the road. You know, it, I, it, it's even worse than that in the sense that four years from now, because remember that's that's the design cycle, right? Yeah, four years. Four from years from now, look. it is going to look so old, yeah. so old. Yeah, you mentioned that on on your daily, and that's such a good point. It's just wow. And, uh, you know, if you look at this thing from a side profile, it could be a Corolla. I mean, there's nothing distinguishing about it whatsoever. I think from a, from a styling standpoint, it actually takes a step back from the current car. And, yeah, look, they've made improvements to it. It's, I, I got a chance to drive it. Very quiet, very smooth, lots of room inside. You know, everything that the... Camry buyer would really want in the car. And for a lot of people, it'll be perfect, but... In, but it's not going to be picture, as many of them as no, in the past. No. They're not going to get the same number of buyers. But I think it's going to pace the Daytona 500, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> which is... Huh? Well, they gave it a gaudy paint job to give it some sort of pizzazz, because, I mean, that's the only way that you can put character lines into the car, is with 
tapes and stripes. It's not in the sheet metal. No, it isn't. The other thing is the interior, yeah, it's good, but there's a couple of real cheesy things to it. Instead of having the, the top of the instrument panel blend into the doors, they tried to do it, but on the top of the IP is this stitching, which is nice, but the stitching doesn't carry over into the door panels. In fact, the door panel, you know, how it, it sort of flares in really doesn't match up well. And to my eye, it was pretty jarring. Well, and there's some good interiors out there in, in the Cruise and the Focus. The cruise is very good. And yeah. Focus, too. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, real visual stimulation going on in those interiors. And I don't know. I really don't know. It's, it's going to be a struggle for them. I, not in the first year. I think they'll have a lot of people that have been waiting in the market, you know, because of the earthquake, there hasn't been the inventory. They might have bought the current generation, but they just felt, no, I'm not going to buy now. I think there'll be a surge when this car comes out. But I give it about a year, and then I think they're going to really struggle to hit their sales numbers. Speaking of surge, the surge man is going to unveil a Maserati based on the Grand Cherokee in Frankfurt, because he wants... He wants him some of that Cayenne market for Maserati. I, good luck with that. I, you know, I don't know. Why? Why don't you think it'll work? Well, I, you know, to me, well, maybe that's just me, but the Maserati is, is still has some, it's an exotic name. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Porsche was too, but it was, uh, Porsche was somewhat appro more approachable. And if it was a Maserati, you think... You know. Exotic, and I think you know. I don't know. Does that immediately mean that all the Maserati dealers in the U.S. are just going to sell those because their sales are like nothing? That's right. So I don't know. I mean, we'll see. It's a good luck. With well, I, I think you you hit it right. I mean, the Cayenne's been so overwhelmingly awesome for Porsche. Uh, maybe not for the pure diehards, but from a bottom line standpoint. Oh yeah, no, I, I, dealer sales. I beat that to death in my column, and I finally gave up. It's just like this whole branding thing. It's it's gone now. The, all the age old lessons. It's just. What are you going to do? I will admit that I drove the new Cayenne because the first one I thought was a disaster. Mm -hmm. I still do. The new Cayenne actually feels like, and from what I understand, Porsche engineers actually spend more than 10 minutes with it. <laughs> and you can tell by the way it drives. Mm -hmm. It's lighter. And then they're bringing out their version of the Audi Q5, uh, Q, yeah, Q5, which will be very interesting. That will be a smaller Porsche. What am I talking about? Porsche shouldn't be building those, but they make money hand over Well, wow. that's at the end of the day with, you know, What are companies their two biggest business. sellers right now? The Cayenne and the Panamera. Yeah. And both high margins. Not that there's low margin Porsches, yeah. but those are especially high margin Porsches. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, you know, Sergio is not just looking at the U.S. market, but China, too. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know, I get all that. Luxury SUVs are red hot with the world over. I mean, the Chinese can't get enough of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just be liking them some SUVs over there. I don't know. Crossovers. You put a crossover tag on it, they want it. So. Hey, another thing that came out last Friday was uh, the Cadillac CL. Oh, it's just gorgeous, really. And... You know, we've talked about it, but I wrote about it. You know, GM, in the last eight years, they can't afford to do stuff like this unless they're telegraphing something. The only car that didn't was the 16, which actually telegraphs some design some elements. Some cues, right. But this telegraphs the Uber sedan they are working on for real. Right. It's going to be... So they just showed the, the convertible now, not but, to give too much. Yeah, right. but the sedan is, is going to be that... Hundred grand at first, and then they're going to add that Roadster down the road, which will be spectacular. I mean, it looks like a Cadillac should look. I mean, it's just—I thought it was stunning. How'd you like those headlamp treatments? Very vertical lamps in the front. Very different kind of treatment than we've seen from Cadillac or anybody for that matter. Yeah, just eliminating all the other things and just have the lighting. I just think I just when they're on their game, they're pretty damn good over there. At, GM design. They are, they are. And you know what I like is the upsweep on the lower part of the rear end. It just transforms the look of that car. I remember walking through the design staff with Ed Welburn 
and we stumbled upon, now that I see it, it was the interior for this concept. He said, you didn't see that. I said, yes, I did, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't quite, I knew it was for the Uber sedan or something, mm -hmm. but there, it, ended, it was that car. Mm -hmm. It was a full buck and it's just gorgeous. It's, it's such a bold statement, it really is. And yeah, it's ballsy, it's great. It's what, it's what, you know, it's what American design should be, I actually think. I mean, just throw it out there. Right. That's, this is an American luxury car. We aren't trying to be like anybody else. This is what we do. Right. And, and be proud of it and stand by it, and sure enough, it looks fabulous. You know, the grill is so interesting to me because the grill actually looks very, if you just had the grill and hung it up on a wall, you'd go, well, that's, isn't that on the DTS right now? And so they've kept this, this design cue that's really, you know, very traditional, and yet the car itself is not at all traditional. It, it's a bold statement. Now that I've seen uh, the next gen CTS, I understand where that grill's going. Uh huh. But the interior is uh, it's just. I mean, I walked literally right by the buck, and it was just like you couldn't keep your eyes off of it. It was just. <laughs> Something else. That's good. Hey, why don't we take our uh, first break right now? Okay. Ben, let's thank our good friends from Chevrolet. Not only does the Chevrolet Cruze offer a ton of features, it features some of the best safety and maintenance in the business. The Cruze comes with rear park assist, which beeps if you're about to back into something. It has rollover mitigation which means the car senses if it might roll over and applies the brakes to the outside front tire to bring the car back under control. And it has OnStar Vehicle Diagnostics, which sends you emails about the latest status of your car. And you can learn a lot more about it at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. Okay, John, a 1954 Ferrari 250 Euro for 850,000. Ooh, is that beautiful? 850, yeah. Fantasyjunction.com. If you ever want to go and have fun looking at cars for sale that you wow. can't afford, but boy, it's good there. <laughs> you would like to have. Are we? Okay. And joining us right now, we've got our guest for the evening, Mark Trossel, from right now, chief de designer for, for Roush, Roush Industries. And what? Roush? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mark, great having you here with uh, it's great Peter and I here. for Autoline After Hours. Great to have Thank you. you for inviting me here. Enjoy. So, my first question's got to be is why does Jack Roush need a chief designer? What are you going to well, be getting into here? Well, I'll tell you what. Obviously, I'm on a pretty steep learning curve about Roush, even though I felt that I, I knew them well. I've known a lot of the players there for a lot of years. Uh, but uh, what I am very impressed with is there, there's two sides to Roush, obviously. You know, the, the, the Roush Fenway racing, everybody knows that, and, and that's high, high visibility. What people don't realize is the diversity within the company. Uh, they do everything from NVH development for the various car companies to entertainment working uh, with uh, Disney, for instance, what? on I, engineering rides and doing you're development. Kidding. I had Absolutely. no idea. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of composites. They're very vertically integrated as far as the ability to do. As we all know, they have a very strong presence in the engineering end. Uh, for powertrain especially. Powertrain, crate motors, uh, certainly the, the, the Roush uh, Mustang that's out in the marketplace today with their uh, supercharger edition, things like that. Uh, they are extremely diverse. Uh, when I talk about being vertically integrated, they have their own in-house tool capabilities of doing hard tools, injection molding. Uh, robotic paint lines, things of that sort uh, that amazes me. I'm still learning. Uh, like I say, it's been uh, only a couple weeks and uh, I'm getting a cram course and what they're all about. Uh, to answer your question, where I see the opportunity is, let's face it, uh, they're in the niche vehicle end of things with their Mustang. And, and you got a strong background in it. And I have 
played around with that for a number of years, going back to my ASC days. And we should and, explain a little bit about that for people who didn't know. That was uh, formerly known as the American Sunroof Corporation right. and run by a guy named Heinz, Heinz Prechter. Heinz Prechter, who was very well known throughout Detroit. And uh, I feel I had a great career there with my 35 years. But if you look back through my history, the, the so-called niche vehicle end of it really seems to be what I'm all about. Because I can go all the way back to, I had my first car uh, uh, when I was 13 years old a Model A coupe. My father was into proper restorations on vintage cars and I always wanted to modify them and do something a little different to them. And so I, I went through that. Of course, the years I had at ASC, I mean, we did everything from uh, early on, the ASC McLarens, uh, which I was heavily involved with, uh, GNX, GTP Turbo, Pontiac Grand Prix. Uh, all the way up to later years with uh, the uh, SSR uh, that, that we did uh, with the retractable roof with General Motors. We were involved from the very initial sketches working with Wayne Cherry on that project. And that certainly was a niche vehicle. And uh, so I see Roush as, as a kind of a culmination, a combination of, of my past history. I've also been playing with, uh, I think some of the folks may know, uh, the vintage hot rods uh, have a company called American Speed, which when I was still at ASC, we did what they call a Dearborn Deuce, which was a 32 Ford uh, that we tried to kind of bring into the... There it is up in the yeah, screen. That's, no, that's the that. new one. That's and that's the, the new one. That's the 33, the Speed 33. What, what's unique about it is the fact that we retained the Roadster look but it has power windows, it has a convertible top that folds up and stows under hard tonneau. So we tried to take the vintage look of the car and bring it up to modern, uh, I guess, comforts, if you will, with the... Uh, now are those turnkeys or...? We, we now, both cars that you see there are turnkeys. Uh, and uh, we started off just manufacturing the body but we all know, you know, what's going on in the economy today. There are still players out there that want something unique. And, and you brought up a, an earlier comment about American design. It, it, you got to be there. You got to be in, in their face with it. There is where I see a fantastic, uh, I guess, legacy of U.S. and, and American design. Uh, we all experienced the, the Woodward Dream Cruise here. In the last couple of weeks, you look at the iconic cars and the following of those vehicles, Camaros, Mustangs, uh, Chargers, and Challengers, and on and on. Uh, the American Hot Rod, in my mind, fits into that. Uh, we have some of our cars in Brazil, in uh, uh, Denmark, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, one in the Philippines. So it's, out of, it's all about Americana, in my mind. And that's what we tried to capture with the... Uh, with so are you gonna keep your hand in that and still do the Roush thing? Or? I am, yes, yes. I have you know, a fair amount of time and, uh, and money invested into that. And uh, I, can't, I don't wanna just walk away. Where are they built? Are they built? They're, they're actually, and that's another thing that, that we really take pride in. They're all US. Every component you see on there is made here in the U.S. or more specifically in Southeast Michigan. The bodies are stamped to the company called Oakley Industry. And uh, I worked with them back in the SSR days. I, I know their history, so they supply the stampings. We develop the convertible top. The castings on the windshield are done here in Detroit. The glass is done in Western Michigan, on and on. So we, we take pride, unlike some of the other uh, replicas bodies that you can buy today that are coming out of China and whatnot, we take pride in the fact that everything you see is... How much are they uh, sticker for? Well, like I tell our customers that ask it, that, depends. it, it depends. <laughs> and, and that is exactly the, the, the bottom line. How much customizing you want. Exa well, and I will tell you, you talk about Roush. Uh, we have uh, two of our cars that have just been completed that have the very high-end uh, Roush 427 IR fuel and electronic fuel-injected motors, $30,000 motors, and you get into unique uh, suspension components that, that come out of 
California, some of the high-end custom builders out there. Uh, you're talking entry, point of entry, we say typically is about 125, and you'll go up to pretty close to 200 grand then for, for a car. But it, they're all unique, they're all different. We sit down with a customer, we talk about what the, their desires are, how are they gonna use the car, uh, what do they want it to be, and then we try and work with them to get to that. So it, it truly does depend on, on what you get, so. So how many people are actively involved in design at Roush that you're gonna be working with? Uh, well, right now, uh, here, here's what I would say about Roush. Uh, very good capability. In fact, one of my first assignments there is, is working on a, on a vehicle that uh, potentially will, will show up even this year at, at the SEMA show. And so I'm working with a group uh, that's been in place that is, in my mind, just spectacular on their ability to do Class A surface. So we all know that uh, times have changed. I'm, I'm an, I won't say an old guy, I'm a well-seasoned guy in the industry, <laughs> how's that? Uh, and the days of doing 2D sketches and you know clay model, we all know, even though today, Anybody in the, in the design industry will tell you it, it's not just computer to production. There's, there's iterative stages and you, you folks are well aware of that. Uh, but what I'm getting at with it, Roush has in place some very solid foundational capabilities on Class A engineering skills, really strong. Uh, they have a studio, but they have the appropriate appointments, if you will, uh, Taurus Mills, uh, clay modeling capability. What I hope to bring to it is, again, with, with my background and a lot of the connections that I have and folks I've worked with over the years, I'm hoping we can take that, I guess, foundation, if you will, to another level. And, and both from an outside resource that folks come along and they, they may have just like uh, contract engineering. Uh, you know, again, Roush does a lot of fundamental engineering, vehicle, and beyond the typical what we consider Detroit automotive. Military, like I, I mentioned with the, the rides and race car performance and on and on. Um, I wanna be a part of that and, and provide perhaps another element to what they could uh, provide to a, an end customer. The other side of it is certainly I want to I want to play in the sandbox with uh, the Roush Performance Mustangs and what other other future products they might have. So I'm excited about it. Uh, I, I see a, a great potential, and again, it falls in line very well with with my background and what I've done over the many years I've been playing. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize how vertically integrated Roush Industries is, and. Uh, mm -hmm that ought to play very well for what you want to do. Right. I, I'm astonished in this country at how much specialty car manufacturing goes on. Yeah. I mean, I'm blown away by it, really, and more and more entrants coming into that sandbox all the right. time. Right. But to have tooling capability, oh, molding yeah. capability, yeah. stamping capability, right. Right. not a whole lot of them have operations yeah. like that. Not, not at all. I mean, they truly can provide what I've learned in my short time there, they truly can provide uh, a full vehicle service support, whatever it might be. Packaging from, from general layout, configuration packaging, you know, interior books, full clay models, chassis engineering, driveline development, uh, manufacturing of components, uh, exterior components, uh, interior trim. Um, you know, it goes on and on what their internal capabilities are. So. That's why I find it exciting. Uh, it, it should be a, a good time for me. You know, when I go to launch Dymaxion Motors, I might have to call Roush to build my first prototypes. <laughs> there you go. They can do it, they can do it. Yep. Hey, you mentioned that your father was into cars, and of course we gotta talk a little bit about your son too, just so the audience knows. Uh, your son Mark is a... a Chief designer of uh, SRT now at, at Chrysler, and uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, it's in played the Played a big role in the Challenger, didn't he pretty much do that he, car? He uh, has played a great role in the, in the facelift on that vehicle. I know he's involved in the, 
uh, and I, I, I hope I'm allowed to say it, but the next, uh, if they were to do a next uh, generation Viper, he's playing a pretty he, significant role. He might be involved role. in that, might He might yeah. be involved in that, but uh, <laughs> again, uh, yeah, I'm proud of him, obviously. He's, he's uh, been with Chrysler for over 15 years now, and uh, I'm happy to see that Chrysler seems to be uh, perhaps headed in the right direction these days with product. And let's face it, it's all about product at the end of the day. Yeah. And, uh, I think they're doing a good job on that. So our relationship as father and son is a little, uh, maybe a little more guarded these days. I can't tell him what I'm doing and he can't tell me what he's doing, but he grew up around it just as I was influenced by my father. Uh, my son grew up, we worked in the garage together on uh, doing a Mustang Capri, uh, redoing it years ago with some ASC McLaren parts and when he was still in high school. And he does have a 32 Roadster. Here's a young guy that's into hot rods today. And so he's, he's having fun with that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's good to see, uh, see him in the business. So it's kind of fun. How did you arrive at ASC way back? Um, interesting story there. I, when I graduated from uh, design school, I, I actually started at Ford Motor Company and started in the Ford Design Studios and the Mustang Studio of all things. So here you go, full circle. Full circle. Uh, and I grew up in the Cleveland, Ohio area, and, and so to me to have an opportunity to come to Detroit and play with the big boys, it was like, wow, this is, this is it. This is exciting. So. Uh, Unfortunately, maybe I wasn't too smart at the time. I didn't realize that that was the Vietnam era and I had a 2S student deferment in, in college. And so five months into my career at Ford, I, I was drafted and uh, had to play Army for a couple of years and went back to Ford. And um, I was introduced to Heinz Prechter uh, from a colleague of mine at Ford and Heinz just had a passion about him and, and you know, really got you fired up and I, I loved his vision. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a hardcore car guy, you know, I like to get my hands into as many pieces of it as I can. And Heinz had a vision that uh, he made me uh, an offer and said, come on, I'd like to have you uh, be a part of where I'm going. And that was very much in the formative years of, of ASC. And so, uh, I made that decision and uh, had, you know, the, the first 35 years there were, were fantastic. And, and again, I had the opportunity to become the first designer, but expand it to the point that, uh, you know, we had a studio in Huntington Beach, California. We had our eight year contract with GM Design in Warren where we had upwards of 100 people there uh, under design contract. Uh, which is kind of unique in the industry to, to provide that kind of service to an OE. Typically, they want to keep it very close to the, the vest. But did that, had the studio in Southgate, and uh, that's how I, I got started there. And, uh, you know, to me, it was, it was a great ride. It's, it's a lot different, certainly, than being in an OE. But the good thing is, I got to travel the world, spend time in Sweden working with Saab. We actually competed with Pininfarina on a full vehicle uh, design development on, on a Saab 900, which ours was selected uh, as their production car. We, you know, I worked with uh, folks at Porsche, with Harm Lagai when he was still head of Porsche Design, did a number of programs with them. We did the 944 and the 968 Cabriolet. Uh, worked on a four-door. You talk about where Porsche's at today, guess what? We were involved in doing an actual prototype four-door based on the 928 many, many years ago. And, uh, and now I understand that uh, Porsche is going to do a two-door coupe version of the Panamera. Really? Yeah, short wheelbase. Uh, that would be interesting. That could be pretty good. Yeah. It could be. It would it would improve the proportions of the car. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Hey look, let's take a, a quick break. We gotta come back to this. But Ben, right now we gotta thank our friends at Hyundai. With gas prices where they are these days, if you're after fuel efficiency, you need to check out the Hyundai Sonata. There's three different models to choose from. The 2.4 liter GDI which delivers a segment-leading 35 miles per gallon, 
Then there's the 2-liter turbo, which offers 274 horsepower, yet delivers 33 miles per gallon, and the brand new hybrid that provides a combined 37 miles per gallon. And you can learn a lot more about each one at HyundaiSonata.com. So you heard Mark Peter and I talking about the, the Cadillac CL earlier. You, you must have seen pictures of it. I'm dying to think. What, what do you make of it? Overall, I have to say, I think Cadillac has done an outstanding job. Uh, you know, you, you look at the, the new CTS, the current Coupe. CTS, the coupe is just Stunning. spectacular on mm -hmm. the highway. That's, that's a, a gutsy move, frankly, uh, in my mind. It, it's a reach out there. I think it's, it's gorgeous. And if you look at, again, we talk about Americana design and what's unique. And, you know, I'll go back to my early days at ASC when we put vinyl tops on them and bright you know, big chrome strips and noses and all that type of thing. And that's what sold at the time. And, you know, obviously they got to the point that, all right, we want to change directions here and what Cadillac's all about. And uh, so my take is, in general, I would say I think Cadillac's done an outstanding job. And, and I've, I've spent some time in the CTS and, uh, you know, the, the GM used to get challenged a little bit on the interiors and obviously they've they've made great strides on really doing a nice job on that so uh, i think it'll do well i i like where they're headed what do you think is missing in car design these days well uh, I'll, I'll tell you I, I think we're seeing a resurgence uh, i can recall some years back when it was all about the uh, so-called international design Cars should look the same all over the world. I think that was a major mistake. Uh, we, we talk about uh, what is unique about America, United States, and there is some DNA there in total. The iconic cars that I talked about before, Camaro, Mustang, and on and on. Um, that, we shouldn't lose. We really shouldn't lose. I also heard you talking about Toyota's latest effort. And to me, there should be, there's always a need out there for appliances, vehicles that are viewed as basic, no frill transportation. But I guess the folks like us that are in the industry, we want more out of it than that. Sure you do. I mean, because, you know, think back to the original Mini. That was a basic, no frills, cheap car, but what an iconic design. Right. right. You, you can have, you know, something for the masses that's not expensive, but you can make it look good, too. And, you know, I, I think Toyota's, you know, played it too safe. In fact, my way of describing it is by trying to play it safe, they're taking a huge risk. And I, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, as Peter and I were talking about, if you look at the Hyundai Sonata, uh, Ford okay. Fusion, Chevy Malibu, or cruise, a lot more character. E yeah. Even the Volkswagen stuff, e even though there's a predictability to it, there's something that's so German about it that, that just I, works. I agree. And uh, I think Toyota's taken a big risk. And, you know, Bob Lutz made, a, I thought, a really interesting point in his latest book where one of the reasons he explained why GM design had gotten so bland is they gave too much power to the vehicle line executives, the VLEs. And the VLEs, by and large, are engineers. And they're making decisions based on timing of the program, are they hitting their budget, right. that sort of thing, right. working with all these diverse elements, engineering, manufacturing, and whatnot. So they're trying to be almost politicians in a way, too. That doesn't work for design. I mean, design, you get out there, you make a statement, and you stick with it. Yep. And I understand sometimes the designers go too far and it becomes very complex to engineer or even more to manufacture. Mm -hmm. But man, if you want people to buy your stuff, you first have got to get them to look at it and only design can do that. It's still an emotional purchase in my mind. Um, you may need a, a set of new wheels or whatever, but you know what? When you get out there and you start looking, it's it's driven by emotion uh, yeah, at the end of the day. Design is the ultimate initial product differentiator, and yep. it's yep. going to be more so as, yes. you know, we have 
technologies that are similar underneath the skin, right. you're going to buy the skin. Yep, I, I agree. Absolutely. To that point, you look at all the auto manufacturers have pro progressed so greatly on quality. You look at the door gaps and margins and fit and finish and whatnot today, they're phenomenal from, from where they were 10 years ago. To your point, what's the differentiation on them? It, it's, what does it look like? I mean, yeah. How do you feel when you're sitting inside behind How do you feel skull? walking up to it? Yeah. How do you feel when you shut it and you walk away from it? Yeah. That's why Panamera owners, I don't know if you notice, but they always back into a space so that when they come out, they just look at the front. Hey, it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think the front end is one of the weak points of the car. There's a blandness to it that I don't quite like. But to drive the car is phenomenal. The car you know? drives fast. And the interior is awesome, yeah. too. So, I mean, but, and you I know. I noticed the new 911 is kind of a combination of the Panamera interior and the a uh, Carrera GT interior. Hmm. It's really, wow. really good. Wow, nice. What else do you like out there when you look around and see what's coming out these days, Mark? Well, again, here, I'll, I'll go back and make a comment. Something that really sticks with me is, you know, I talk about my history with uh, the early uh, muscle cars and the cars that kind of lit my fire at that time. People today, don't realize what they have to choose from today, though. If, if, you, if you have the opportunity to, to drive a, a new Mustang, uh, I, I happened to have the opportunity here last week to drive one of the, the Roush new Mustang with the supercharger on and on and on. And I've, I've driven the new Camaro SS, and, and my son has had a number of uh, nice Chrysler products, uh, SRT Challenger and whatnot. Those cars are phenomenal today. They, you, you don't even realize the speed you're, you're doing in them. Uh, you know, NVH, they're quiet, they're refined. You know, the motor revs like crazy and you're, you're there before you know it. Uh, fit and finish, on and on. And, and people get hung up on it, and I'm one of them. You know, you look back and, oh yeah, gee, I'd love to, you know, big block Camaro back and whatever. Those cars couldn't hold a candle. They, oh, they yeah. didn't handle, they didn't stop. <laughs> When you go drive an old car, I mean, yeah, we all love them, but when you actually go drive one of them, it's like, oh, okay, then you realize that the cars today are just yeah. in a whole nother right. dimension. Yep, they, they really are. So that, which I think is, is a great step forward. Hey, it's uh, getting to be time for rapid fire. So uh, before we get to that, though, we've got to take a break, and they've got to give me the questions for Rapid Fire too. But, Ben, let's thank our friends at Bridgestone. Bridgestone is featuring its third generation of run-flat tires with groundbreaking new technology. Current run-flat tires can offer peace of mind for consumers, but the added mass and the stiffer sidewalls can compromise ride comfort and fuel efficiency. The new third-generation Bridgestone run-flat tires reduce heat and improve performance and ride comfort. Whether you're a program manager in the industry or just looking for a set for your personal car, check it out at BridgestoneTire.com. Okay, well, this is the part of the show, Mark, where we turn to our audience questions. So, Ben, let's kick it off with that graphic. <laughs> Okay, the first one comes in from Goggles Pisano, who wants to know, Mr. Trossel, what do you think of the styling of the Iacocca Mustang? <laughs> well, if, if, here, I'll, I'll make some comments. If you go all the way back to the, certainly the, the first generation, which I consider the, the Iacocca Mustang, given the time, let's face it, it was, it was a marketing genius. Uh, it was a, an extremely successful product. And, and I love the first generation Mustang. Uh, my first new car was a 67 uh, S-Code big block four speed fastback. Uh, just like actually it was the same color and everything as the bullet car. And I, I mean, I love those cars. Uh, the 67 eight to me was, was a, a little nicer than the first gen just because it was a little larger, but yet it was still a tight, nice, nicely done package. We could all go on and say what happened when they 
built the uh, Mustang too, but that's another story. Yeah. Are you referring to the recent Iacocca Mustang? The, Was there another one? Yeah, oh, I'm like sorry. Two years yes, ago. yes. Okay, I am aware of that. And actually, Metal Crafters built, I think, 50 of those cars. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize. I went back to yeah, the original. Yeah, no, I did too. I, that's what I thought the question yeah, referred but, to. Yeah, uh, but yes, that's a, a significant piece of work. The the entire uh, greenhouse was changed on it. Uh, there was some beautiful execution and, and whatnot on it. And uh, from the standpoint, I think it's more of a designer statement than than it is something that hits you. Yeah. That you know, I I, I believe those cars go for a hundred plus. Uh, if over 100 grand, uh, and uh, it's a nicely refined car, very well done. You know, I don't know if it's something people will obviously are going to go out and uh, grab hold of. So, okay, next one. Uh, Jeremy from Dallas says, "I always thought designer types wore flashy pocket squares or weird scarves." <laughs> and and for those who are just listening, Mark's not wearing anything but like a. a a fairly plain blue shirt. Well, I have facial hair, so maybe that uh, you know, <laughs> gives me a, a little different look. But uh, yeah, we're, we're not all out there on the fringes. Uh, Mike D. White says, which one worked on the 1998 LH program? I think maybe he's referring to Mark Jr.? Mm -mm. Not the 98, no. Uh, that, I, I would go all the way back and give Tom Gale credit for being the driver behind that vehicle. I mean, that was yeah. the Tom Gale days, and Tom certainly did some great things at, at Chrysler, uh, so I'd give him credit. Here's a non-design comment from Will, who says, didn't GM and Daimler Chrysler already team up on the rear wheel drive hybrid tran transmission technology that GM now uses? Thus, the Ford-Toyota partnership seems natural. And that, that's a good point. It wasn't just GM and Daimler Chrysler, but BMW is part of that, yeah, too. Yeah, the dual mode hybrid. The dual mode hybrid, but uh, is GM the only one using that now? Chrysler's not using it at all. I don't think Daimler or BMW are using it either. Unless, Unless they're using it in that X6 hybrid, I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I should look into that. Uh, Mine VW says, why aren't there any industry-leading battery hybrid technology companies like LG in the U.S.? What's happened to industry-leading innovation in the U.S.? Well, there is. There's A123, yeah. which is uh, an American. And several others that are flying under the radar. There, there are several others. Here in Michigan, there's a couple of them coming There's a up. couple of them, and in Indiana as well. There's some uh, advanced battery companies there, too. So it's, it's not just LG, but LG is clearly a mega player in the field. And uh, that's what GM signed up with for the Volt, although they signed up with A123, who, by the way, is building all their electric vehicle batteries about two miles from where we're sitting right now. So very local to us here. Oh. Uh, George from Brooklyn says, and this is to you, Peter, comparing the Camry to white bread is an insult to white bread. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, wow. I guess I'd agree. <laughs> Mitch says, Peter, every week you have a rant for us. Has the Tuesday night ever come when you had nothing? Yes, uh, there has been um, more days than I care to admit to when I'm writing my column, Wednesday column at 5 in the morning on Wednesday, sometimes even 8 in the morning. Sometimes, you know, it's like a gift. I can't explain it, and then it goes away. <laughs> Yeah, writing's funny for me. If I know what I want to write about, oh, yeah, boom, it just goes together. If I got to think about, boy, what do I write about now, it, it can take forever. I've been doing it for 12 years. It's a long slog. It can be. <laughs> and I can't phone it in because all of my followers would accuse me of phoning it in. So it's, you got to stay on it. That's right. I don't mind. Okay, Scotty in Cleveland's got a question for you, too. Did you already know about what the CL concept looked like before Cadillac unveiled it last week? Uh, <clears throat> in my meanderings uh, through GM design with Ed, you, you know, when you ever do that with Ed, you always have to keep your eyes open. And I walked, or they showed me some stuff on the shape of Cadillac to come. 
And on the, some of the stuff they were showing, I saw the Uber sedan sitting there. I didn't say anything. But when I saw the CL Roadster, I, I, I said, ah, okay, I get it. It's going to be a spectacular car. If they can deliver the product-wise, it's going to be... It's going to be something. They'll do well. They'll, They'll do, do well. They'll do very well. And, and like you were even saying, Mark, they, they are doing the right things. They and it's, it's, so. But to crack the, the true luxury market, it, it takes not only doing everything right, it takes time. It takes time. Well, yeah, and, and, and GM has learned that with Cadillac. I mean, the CTSVs are considered to be every bit, you know, a competitor to the Germans and whatever's out there. And it's been a long slog. It's been 10 years for Cadillac. Mm. And um, so now they're ready to take this next step. And they know the, mechanically what that vehicle has to be. I don't think design-wise they have to worry. Mm -hmm. They're going to be very much one of the, the avant-garde look, the Cadillac of Cadillacs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they need to be. And if they can deliver the package, they'll be successful. Mm -hmm. Though I still keep pointing out, and this goes back in the 20s, when Cadillac decided it was going to take on Packard as the premier mm -hmm. American luxury with, with car. With V16s and V12s. And took them 20 years. Yep. Doing everything brilliantly right. It took them 20 years. And they brought Harley Earl in to and start it, it, designing exactly right. LaSalle and mm -hmm. Cadillac to, to mm -hmm. be competitive. Yeah. DC Auto Geek has also got a question for you, Peter. He says, GM announced a ship-to-shore review of its $3 billion global media account. Is this legitimate, a legitimate review or the first of many Dan Ackerson cost-cutting measures? Uh, it's a legitimate review. Uh, it is based on a cost-cutting mission, but I also think Joe Owanek's going to use it as a way to uh, Joe really likes creativity brought to him, and he's looking for the most creative media play. And they've got a huge budget. But and every time you change an account in advertising, there are economies that are extracted from the new agency because they're all like, <laughs> "We want the business." So, yeah, there's certainly it's a cost-cutting move, and and yeah, Ackerson is behind a lot of that. But I think Joel's going to use this as a way to get more creative thinking around GM's media spend, which is staggeringly huge. Now, they have, what, 20 different companies that do media buying for them. <clears throat> is this a move just to start paring that down? Yeah, that's that's into it, and that's part of it, too. Hmm. Okay, uh, Ross Guitano in Caldwell, New Jersey, wants to know, do you guys know where the next chassis will come from for the next generation Ford Mustang? Will it come from any of the new Lincoln offerings, since it's highly rumored to have independent rear suspension? Uh, that's going to be a unique chassis within Ford, and uh, will they use it for other things? Of course they will. No one does just... No one can afford just to do a one-off. Unless one -off. you're Ferrari or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you don't even tool it up. You just make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's one that would be interesting for you, Mark. Uh, NHTSA denied Pagani entry into the U.S. ostensibly because of airbags. You know, they're, they're looking for an airbag uh, uh, exemption. Uh, and he asks, should there be an exemption for super low volume cars and will it ever happen? Well, actually, there is. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it, there was. Huh? Yeah. The, and there, even in the next rules, there is. The next uh, rules package. Yeah. It, it, it's low volume, you know. But why would Base. Pagani be denied? There was some aspect of the airbag that thing that they didn't deliver that they were supposed oh, to deliver. Okay. And, yeah. and I think it's also probably Pagani saying, you know what, I, yeah. you're just pissing me off now or something like that. So yeah. there's, there's a political You, you, you can ask for certain exemptions, but you have to prove that you have tried or you are in the process of developing or whatnot. So there, there's, you know, it gets a little gray on the, the ways to do it, but there are ways to get exemptions on certain volumes. Yeah, rigging up a series of Jiffy Pop bags and you're, <laughs> isn't going to really fly. That's not going to work. Okay, Baja Busta wants to know, Peter, what do you think of the 2012 Camry NASCAR commercials? I think that's just ludicrous, but... 
That's just me. I mean, Toyota's just hell-bent on becoming part of the American fabric, and part of that component is to get into NASCAR, and it's just like, you know, it just puts me to sleep, but, you know. They've got who I consider the most talented driver in NASCAR, Kyle Busch, Kyle Busch yeah. and they've got Joe Gibbs Racing, which is a fine racing mm -hmm. organization, so. But if they flipped a switch and were running Chevys tomorrow, or Fords, you know, they'd still be running good. I mean, it just doesn't matter. Right. Mm. Making that connection with Toyota, I, I don't get it. Uh, here's another question for you, Mark. What are your thoughts on Jack Telnack, who was a guest here a few weeks ago? What are my thoughts on him? Yeah. I, I personally know Jack. Uh, I've known him for a lot of years. Uh, I have a lot of respect uh, if you go back to what he did at Ford Motor Company on the first Fox platform, 79 Mustang, Capri. That was a very unique design at the time, and it was a breakthrough. And I give Jack Telnack credit for pushing that through and making it happen. And uh, I think Jack was, uh, was a great uh, uh, contributor at Ford Design, my take. In fact, when you think about it, the current generation Ford Mustang traces its roots right back to that Fox yeah, platform yeah. Mustang that he came out with one in 1979. 79. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing with it was uh, I bought one. Uh, and one of the reasons I bought it, guess what? It was the first V8 five-speed manual transmission car you could have bought for quite some time at, at the time. It sounded good. It had all the attributes of what that muscle car yeah, at Yeah, that was just when been. Detroit started to come out of the wilderness yeah. with dealing with emissions and they finally, yeah. the electronics started to, to really come on and you could get a V8 with yep. some power and yep. that, that was yeah. Significant. You no, know, it was. It was a big change. I mean, because was, you know, yeah. towards the end of the '70s, things were getting really bad. Yeah, 165 horsepower Z28 Camaro. I know. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it couldn't even merge with the thing. So, Unsprung wants to know: When is GM going to have a small truck in the U.S. market? I would say it's not. Not anytime soon. That's my guess. Yeah, there's a huge audience out there that want, you know, smaller trucks. I mean, because I hear it all the time, wherever I go, you know, and, but these manufacturers just aren't interested in doing it. No, they're not. And, you know, part of the problem is when you get down to a lease payment or even a monthly financial payment, bank payment, the difference between a full-size truck and a compact truck isn't a whole lot of money. Yeah. And the first thing the salesperson in the dealership wants to do is talk you up into the bigger one. And, you know. Because they get a better sales. And I'm sure savvy viewers out there understand at the end of the year, you can get yourself a full-size pickup. Granted, not loaded very much, but the value you get yeah. for what you spend is just staggering. It is, yeah. Well, you know, there's only a small handful of trucks right now, small ones of which the Toyota Tundra is the only one that sells in any real numbers. You got the Nissan Frontier, the Ford Ranger, which they've been trying to kill off for years. They've never been able to do it. There's just always enough buyers just not to kill it and off. And there's a new Ranger, which they're not bringing. But they're not bringing it here because, again, <clears throat> it, it competes too much with the F-150. Yeah. And uh, they're just not going to do it. But, uh, and then uh, GM's got, what, uh, the Canyon and uh, What's the name of the other one? But I, uh, Colorado. Colorado, thank yeah. you. Which uh, also was the H3, mm -hmm. the basis for the H3, which they never showed. The Hummer killed, H3, yeah. that's right. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't see a small truck in GM's future right now myself. Yeah. It, what's going to be interesting is, you know, Chrysler's killing off uh, the Dodge Dakota, Dakota, but they're also talking about doing a quote unquote lifestyle pickup truck based off the minivan platform. So uh, we'll have to stay tuned and see if that comes out and how it does. But it, wh wh what's your thoughts, Mark? Well, I, I go back, when you, when you talk about General Motors, I mean, they had an alliance with Isuzu at one time where they played in that arena, powertrain from Isuzu and things like that, but I don't view that as being real successful and and I, I tend to agree with everything you've said you look at what you can buy value-wise today in a full-size pickup 
it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, I, if uh, you if you live in regions of the country, well, this whole rear wheel drive thing. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, you can equip your truck to drive with rear wheel drive, but uh, you know, at the end of the year, there are always price leader trucks yeah. sitting on dealerships, and you can yeah. buy a full size pickup yeah. for. 20 grand or less, yeah. and that's a hell of a lot of vehicle it for is. that money. It is. Yeah. But you know, some people just don't like the size. They yeah. want something smaller. Exactly. And, uh, I, I get it. And but, you, you yeah. should make products yeah. for that. But don't hold your breath waiting for it. No, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> yeah. Okay, Lewis wants to know, when is the next generation Mustang going to be revealed? He says, I'm hearing rumors of a heavy refresh for the 2013 model year and a total redesign on the 50th anniversary. It's not not my position to talk about that, so I'll, I'll let it go at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mark knows a whole lot more than he's letting on to here. No. I have an inkling when it'll be, but I'll just shut up about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, w when did the current generation come out? Two years ago? I'd have to look it up. But you know, typically these things are on a four-year product cycle. Yeah, the next car is all new car all new so we shall see yeah. okay real good well look uh we're hitting the top of the hour here so it's probably time to to wrap it up but mark trossel thanks so much for coming on thank this you great thanks, having sir. you on well, it's been good great. to learn a whole lot more about roush industries too and what all it's capable of doing and getting into as well stay tuned as they say right that's great that's great thank you and peter great seeing you too man see you john as always and, uh, of course, folks, we really thank you for having tuned in. Don't forget that uh, you can get this show at the iTunes store. It will be posted there later tomorrow afternoon. Just go to the iTunes store, look for AutoLine After Hours. It's free. You can always follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash AutoLine Detroit or Twitter, twitter.com slash AutoLine. Follow Peter's stuff at autoextremist.com. Or you can follow him at twitter.com slash autoextremist. He's also got his Facebook page. You can also go look for his, his new book there, Witch Hunt. Yeah. That's on there. But uh, thanks, folks, for having tuned in. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. We forgot to mention Roaster Jack. Oh, got to mention him. GreatNoroco.com, folks. And thanks to Scotty in Cleveland again. That's right. So you're just here at just a few miles away. Yes, uh, off of uh, just, what is it, Market Street is where I'm at, uh -huh. which is off of LeVan there. And I know at one point Roush had, what, something like 38 oh, buildings or they, something they like have, that? They have an enormous, they, they've been trying to, like I say, uh, force feed me on, on bringing me up to speed on everything. And we've spent days traveling uh, at the various, just here in, in the Detroit area, but down in Allen Park, they have a huge facility. There's 400,000 square foot under roof down there, just in garage services to Ford Motor Company. Wow. And, uh, you know, they, they have a, a design, uh, engineering design center also in Allen Park, and uh, it, it is. There's, you're, you're absolutely correct. There's something like 40 facilities, and not to mention, the NASCAR garages, uh, obviously, down south, and uh, so they're very impressive. And they, they're they're approaching 3,000 employees at this point, too. That's big. So, That's a big yeah. operation. Yep. You know, years ago, I gave a speech at uh, Monroe Community College, and I met the, uh, the president or the CEO of the school, hmm. and she said, oh, mm -hmm. you're in automotive. You must know Jackie Roush. <laughs> And I go, Jackie Roush, never heard of him. She goes, oh, of course you've heard of him. He's into racing and all this stuff. And I go, oh, Jack Roush. He used to teach math he there. taught <laughs> physics oh, no. there. Taught oh, physics. No. I didn't know that. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. And so she said, Jack Roush. Oh, we always called him Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> so.
Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, he was a physics teacher way back when. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So you must be pretty smart to teach physics is I my, guess, what I figure. I guess. My, my background knowledge on, on Jack Roush goes back to the Gap and Roush drag racing days. Uh, the yeah, that's where he really made his name. Is that right? T oh, yeah. Tijuana Taxi it was a, a Maverick, I believe. Yeah, that they was built a, it. A drag car. That's really? where he made his, his bones was on those race drag racing yeah. engines. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's where he got started. So, And then I remember the Trans Am series also when he yeah, yeah. more or less progressed into Trans Am mm -hmm. racing with Mustangs again and Capri and even Mercure, I think he. Did well, that was something. when that was a branding thing when when yeah, uh, Ford was trying to establish a Mercury Mercure, yeah. so they converted all their Trans oh, okay. Am entries into Mercury Mercures. Mm -hmm. right. They were Roush Mustangs underneath. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. That was Bob Lutz move, you know, to call it the Mercure, which means Mercury in German. Yeah. I didn't know that. And he had come over from uh, Ford of Europe and wanted to spark some life into uh, the Mercury brand. <clears throat> and he said, hey, they all want imports. Let's give them some good German imports. And uh, it was a disaster. Yeah, uh, never caught on, that's for sure. Well, they, they, they Of heroic up. proportion. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, everybody called it here Merker, which doesn't sound as good as Mercur. <laughs> and they could never train Americans to pronounce it right. And then they, they totally botched the launch. So the dealers had all the signs and the literature and the whole nine yards. The advertising was running, and there were no cars. So people would literally go in and say, hey, I want one of those Merkers. And they go, sorry, we don't have any. And then uh, they tried to appeal to enthusiasts, so they brought in manual transmission cars. And the car, the styling, actually appealed to a lot of women hmm. who had no interest in driving a manual, manual transmission, transmission car. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, the first full year was a, it was a disaster. It never got any traction. Mm. And then they brought the Scorpio over, which okay. wasn't a bad car either, yeah. but it was a big jump in price. And uh, hmm. the XR4 Ti, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was a mouthful to say, was, yep. was pricey for what it was. And then the Scorpio was just too big of a jump yeah. for Mercury buyers. Sure. And it just never worked. It was yeah, a disaster. Yeah. And I, I, I can't blame the cars, really. I think they just botched the whole effort. The whole effort, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't something that would appeal to the traditional Mercury buyer at no, that point. No, not at all. Not it at was all. somewhere else at that point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good. Well, I better go take Ike home. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your MacBook Air, Chip. It saved me. <laughs> <laughs>